All right, welcome everyone to the Kidlit Distancing Social. I'm Laura Backus, the publisher of Children's Book Insider, the Children's Writing Monthly. Welcome. We are going to have an awesome, awesome chat today with a great guest. But first, some of our usual business to take care of. And if you're new to us, welcome. And if you're watching on the replay and you're new to us, welcome to you too. So first of all, uh, if you want to get on our list to know everything we do and to know about all of our future Kidlet Distancing Social guests, uh, you can go to writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate dash cheat sheet and sign up and you will get a free ebook uh, as our thank you for that. Uh, this is our, we just finished our 30th year in business. We are starting our 31st year in business as of this month. Um, so I'm going to have to change this slide. Um, it says get 30 years of children's writing knowledge. <laughs> now it's going to be 31. Anyway, all of our best beginner tips we compiled into this one ebook. It's yours for getting on our list. And so you can be notified of all the stuff we do. And if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, Children's Book Insider, which is the thing that is celebrating its 31st year as of this month, uh, you can go to writeforkids.org forward slash CBI and get a special rate of $5 a month delivered to your inbox every month. It's about 20 pages a month, uh, market info, uh, lots of great how-to articles on writing and interviews with authors, editors, and agents. Um, we also have a special Above the Slush Code interview every month with either an agent or an editor. Uh, and that allows you to jump over the slush pile with your submission if you use that code. That alone is worth $5 a month, I think. Plus, you get access to our online uh, CBI Clubhouse, which houses all of that 30 plus years of information that you will have access to as a subscriber. So thank you, Catherine. Oh, and Steve, thank you. Saying nice things about CBI in the uh, chat box here. Susan asked if we offer online critique groups. We do have, uh, through the Clubhouse, we have uh, member groups um, divided by age. So there's one for picture books and easy readers, one for chapter or I think it's picture books, then chapter book and easy readers, then middle grade and young adult, I believe. And then there's a nonfiction one. I believe that's how they're divided up. You can go on there and you can hook up with other um, members if you want uh, and create your online critique groups. You're welcome to do that. Okay. Thank you, Brenda. Okie dokie. Now we get to celebrate. Yay! This is when you send me good news and I announce it to the world. So we have a great one today. Uh, Susan Burrett self-published her, her uh, picture book, SOS God, illustrated by Win Kang. Um, and it's a collection of humorous poems. Um, I miss, that's a misprint for me. Humorous poems that inspired children to pray. <laughs> and it debuted in February, 2020. And this month she created a really awesome, very energetic YouTube video uh, where she reads the book and talks to kids about the content of her book. So congrats Susan on that. And I hope that this video gets lots of great exposure for you. If any of you wanna watch it, you can just go to YouTube and Type in SOS God and it'll come right up. So I want to hear your good news. Send it to me, mail at writeforkids.org and put celebrate in the subject line and we will feature you on a future Kidlet Distancing Social. I will run book covers. I will run links to websites, whatever you want. And no news is too small to celebrate. So if you did find a great critique partner, let me know and we will celebrate it with you. Links of interest. I always try to get one good link a week that I think you're going to enjoy. This is really an interesting one. It's from the BookBub Partners blog, 17 Instagram promotion ideas from publishers. Um, so these are, are ideas that publishers are actually using to help market books on Instagram. 
and you can use the same techniques. And so for those of you who are trying to figure out how to incorporate Instagram into your marketing strategy, I would strongly suggest you read this. Um, I created a direct link bit.ly forward slash Instagram promotions. And you can go check that out. It's a really great article. Okay, now I get to introduce my awesome guest for tonight. Sneed B. Collard III is the author of more than 80 award-winning books. He's best known for his science-based uh, nonfiction for readers ages 5 to 12 and his middle grade in YA mysteries and thrillers. In 2006, Sneed was the recipient of the Washington Post Children's Book Guild Children's Nonfiction Writer of the Year Award for his body of work, which is very impressive. In 2010, he sought to address the shortage of quality regional children's books by launching his own publishing company, Bucking Horse Books. It's located in Montana and distributed by Mountain Press. Bucking Horse Books releases books of special interest to kids and educators in the West, which is awesome. We're gonna talk a little bit about that, about having sort of a, a niche independent press. So Sneed, come on with me. Okay. Welcome. Can you see me now? I can see you now. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. And a special shout out to my friend Steve Winnie Swinburne out there, mm -hmm. who I haven't seen in way too long because of COVID and other things. But um, thanks so much for having me on the show. Yeah, well, we're really, we're really thankful you're here. We're, we're, this is going to be really fun. Um, but before we get started, I have to tell you that, um, uh, that I think you have the best author name ever. <laughs> and I'm sure other people have told you this. Um, but I just think it's such a cool name. It's, we talked about dogs before we got started. That's my dog barking right out there. Um, uh, yeah. I think I think the pizza just arrived. She's very excited. Um, anyway, your name is great. It's it's fun to say. It looks cool on the cover of the book. It's easy to remember. I just think, and I think with with your name, you kind of had to write for kids. I don't see what else you could really have done with your life. So <laughs> that's a very good point. And I, though I can't take any credit for my name, I will tell everyone that I earned it through all the teasing growing up. So, you know, yeah. putting up with all that, at least I get to use it later. I get to use it. I was thinking today, the only other, you know, I I could see Sneed B. Collard as a judge in the West, in the Wild West, but he's, he's from the East. He's a big city educated judge that he hopped the train and he came out West. He landed in like Deadwood or somewhere. Yeah. And was this honorable judge and all the outlaws thought he was going to be soft because he's a city boy, but he wasn't. And I could just see the honorable Sneed B. Collard III going down in history. So that's the other thing you could have done. And I think you made the right choice. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, let's, let's get started here. I want to talk about your books and, and you very kindly sent me a whole bunch of your books and I've just had such fun reading through them here. Um, I, I actually have, have known your work for quite a while, um, but it was fun to see a lot of your new stuff. So a lot of the, the nonfiction that you write is in that illustrated format, but it's kind of for a little older than what we consider the typical picture book age. It's kind of for like six to 10 or eight to 12. It's, it's, it's longer text and, and the information is a little more in-depth. Um, so for example, your newest one waiting for warbler, and I love the illustrations in this, this is out from Tilbury house just recently, right? This came out just, yeah, just a couple a months ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice. Um, this really has two parallel stories in it. One of two kids who are, um, getting their, their yard ready for the birds they're they're watching the birds come in uh in the spring they've they've planted native plants they've done all the right things to attract the birds and they're really hoping that a rare cerulean warbler shows up mm -hmm. um and then you have a parallel story of the warbler's um, migration from the yucatan peninsula 
600 miles all the way up to its summer home in the United States. And so you've got two things going in this picture book simultaneously, which is pretty complex it for is. a picture book. And it creates a lot more words than we typically see. Um, I'm just going to show a couple pages here. I hope you all can see that. Uh, in a picture book, do you know how many words you actually ended up with here in this in this book? Well, I looked it up. I didn't really know till I saw you were going to ask me about that. <laughs> but there were about uh, 1,700 words ultimately. Okay, okay. That is, you know, when I started in publishing back in the mid 80s, that was not terribly uncommon to have picture books that went 1500 word range, even a little more for nonfiction. And then they started getting shorter, 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 shorter. So this feels very sort of old school to me in a lot of ways with the, with it, which is great. I mean, I think that it's, it's nice. And then once you have these two stories come together where the warbler does appear in the kid's yard, then we still go through a couple months of summer as right. the warbler builds its nest and the fledglings hatch. This is a big time span. So was what age do you see this as as for this this particular book? What kind of age reader were you thinking of? Yeah, so I think with with read aloud, I'd be thinking first grade or so. And but then by by second grade, I think kids would be reading that themselves. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, it, people do read it aloud, but it is, as you pointed out, on the longer end. So I, th I think it more of a, a kind of a gateway book for beginning yeah. readers to really enjoy. And I, it's, I, I, oh yeah, it's interesting. Um, when I first wrote the story, I only had the Warblers migration story in it. And it was actually my editor at Tilbury who suggested the dual stories. And I, I love it. That hasn't happened much in my career, that kind of uh, collaboration or sure. suggestion that really works. but but. This really did. And so I was so glad that um, Jonathan Eaton, uh, the publisher at Tilbury, uh, came up with that suggestion. Mm -hmm. Terrific, terrific. By the way, if any of you have questions for Sneed, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to those toward the end. Um, though, Steve, I see you have a question. Are you referring to this particular book, Steve, in your question? He's wondering if you would read a few sentences, Sneed, from this. Sure. Do you want me to do that now? Or? Why not? Let's okay. do it. Sure. <laughs> okay. The warblers tasted especially good with barbecue sauce. No, oh no, no, sorry, that's not this book. That's your, that's your next book, yeah. <laughs> that's the next one, sorry. Um, okay, so we actually start out with the family here. Do you think any birds will nest here this year? Nora asked, her breath misting in the crisp spring air. If they find what they're looking for, Owen answers, I hope they do, Nora says, especially a sky blue bird. Owen laughs. You mean a cerulean warbler? Yeah, that one. They're really rare. We only saw one of them last year and it was just passing through. I know, but maybe it will stay longer. And that's the illustration. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thousands of miles to the south, the tropical forests begin to stir from Peru and Colombia all the way through Panama, Costa Rica, and southern Mexico. Thousands of birds are getting ready. Millions of birds. Ooh, yeah, there's some gorgeous birds in the in these illustrations. Just yeah, I love the art in this book. Yeah, yeah, and then it just it just flips back and forth from there between the two stories. Between the two stories, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to slip in an extra question here uh, that I didn't send you ahead of time <laughs> because I've been asked this by by people when writing nonfiction, um, and your book takes place. Uh, spans quite a long time span as this one does. How do you sort of express that to kids who might not have a concept of a long period of time? Now this book, because you're kind of hitting sort of that 
first, second, third, even fourth grade audience, you know, they're going to have a little more of a, a concept of time. But if you're writing a little bit younger, have you ever had to tackle that with a topic? Um, time and also large numbers, you know, how do you yeah. convey that? Well, um, it is interesting because I have done that in a few other books. I wrote a book called A Platypus Probably, uh, which actually goes through the whole life cycle of a platypus, uh, female mating and the, hmm. the, the um, eggs being hatched and the little platypups, they called them. <laughs> and so, um, but you know, no one has ever even really brought up dealing with the time and whether that's an, an issue. I will say, thinking about my other books, um, they do tend to be very compressed time periods. So yes. it all happens in one night or one mm -hmm. day or something like that. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So, um, so this one, yeah, I, I haven't honestly really thought about it, except that writing a picture book, you have to get really good at eliminating anything that's not essential. Right. So you can make these big, vast jumps because everything that's happening in between is boring and doesn't push the story along, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's where the real art of writing a picture book comes in, is knowing just how fast you can go mm -hmm. to cover that ground. Right, right. And also, you know, the illustrations are going to help convey the passage of time, too. Like in this book, we go from sort of early spring to late summer, and you see with the the trees and the clothes that the kids are wearing, etc., that it has gotten the seasons have changed. Um, but someone asked in the chat box, and this is the last time I'm taking a question off the chat box, and you all have to put it in the Q and A. <laughs> but this is a really good question. <laughs> um, what? Why did you choose to write this in present tense? because you've got a, la a long time span, plus it's in present tense. That's, that seems like that would make it harder to tell the story. So this book was inspired by my son and I going down to a place called High Island, Texas. I see a few of the people uh, joining us are from Texas. And the, uh, it was during the warbler or the, the spring bird migration. And High mm -hmm. Island is the first place that a lot of these birds reach when they've just finished this exhausting trip across mm -hmm. the Gulf of Mexico. And so I wanted to write a book about that trip and just how life and death that journey is. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I chose present tense is to add drama to the story. Mm -hmm. And I've done that in quite a few of my books to add drama. I think it really does add drama. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, and it's really an instinctual process. Every once in a while, I will try something in past and present tense and see which one I like better. But mm -hmm. usually it's just an instinctive decision. Right. And, and it sets a mood. It sets, I think present tense sets a more serious mood uh, or a weightier mood for a book like this. It does, because it's almost like if it's if it's past tense, the narrator knows how it all turned out but in present tense the narrators doesn't know either you know we're all finding it out at the same time so you're right it is it does add more drama i never really thought of it that way but but you're absolutely right so you this is published by tilbury house <laughs> um several of your books are actually um you also have your own Press, Bucking Horse Books, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But why did you choose to not publish this through your own press? Uh, a number of different reasons, actually. One is if you look at the books I published through Bucking Horse Books, uh, none of them have <clears throat> illustrators. Hmm. Uh, so they're either novels, which don't require that, or they're illustrated with photographs that I'm able to take myself. Mm -hmm. And that is basically an economic decision. It's just that the numbers do not add up self-publishing a book right. if you have to hire an illustrator to illustrate it. Mm -hmm. I started once actually early on, I actually had hired an illustrator and she did a beautiful first sample for me. And I just um, kept running the numbers and I just realized it was not going to work out financially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so. 
that's the main reason I would love to hire illustrators because, oh, it's just so fun, like I said, to see what illustrators come up with. Sure. Uh, and to me, it's one of the most fun parts of a, of a picture book is that surprise, that aha, like uh, what the illustrator come, comes up with. But yeah, it just didn't make sense for me with the kinds of books I was doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's good to know. That is that makes complete sense. It is very expensive to hire an illustrator, and you cannot skimp on the illustrations no. in a picture book. So yeah. important. Right? Yeah, if you ask your your kid to do it or something, um, mm -hmm. you know that might be a lot of fun, but it's not going to be received. No. Like, the book deserves to be received. So, Correct. Yeah. yeah. So on the distancing social, um, we've talked, we've had several guests who who write nonfiction, and we've talked about sort of different types of nonfiction, primarily narrative nonfiction mm -hmm. and expository nonfiction. Um, for those people who are who are new to us or just starting out writing nonfiction for kids, can you give me your brief definition of the two types um, and sort of talk about how you decide how you're going to write each book? Yeah, so um, with with uh, expository nonfiction, that's usually when I'm just wanting to present information. Mm -hmm. And I do that in a lot of different ways. I might have really young picture books um, in fact, let me grab one of them really quickly. Okie dokie. Let me adjust my light because I'm suddenly in the dark. <laughs> in my dark fishbowl. So, um, so here's a picture book called The Deep Sea Floor that I wrote uh, quite a long time ago. And it, it's just, I just wanted to give people a, a really good idea of what the deep sea floor is like. Mm -hmm. Actually, even this one is not a good example because I'm always looking for storytelling in right. how I present the information. Mm -hmm. And anytime you can tell a story, I guarantee you it's going to be better than if you're not telling a story. Right. On mm -hmm. the other hand, if you have a book like uh, Birds of Every Color here, mm -hmm. um, then you, it kind of sounds like a story, even though it's not. So here I've got birds come feathered in every color. And then um, it just goes, the big text kind of tells a story from page to page, from cardinal reds to bluebird blues, to oriole oranges and a thousand colors in between. So even though it's not technically a story, it sets up this rhythm, mm -hmm. this rhythm and voice mm -hmm. that makes it feel like a story to really young readers. But if you look at it, it is exposition, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not, you're not telling a story. And then also on each page, then you had a lot of facts about Correct. each bird, right? Yeah, I, I, I put um, kind of big text and small text. And uh -huh. so I write it to be read aloud with the big text and then uh, they can go back um, and talk about the little text with sure. students or, or kids uh, or the kids can read it themselves. Mm -hmm. And in and fact, it's yeah. kind of a nice method to draw kids in to wanting to read and to work to get that extra information. And and depending on the age of kid you're you're maybe reading it to, it works for the very, you know, the preschoolers, the, the big text works very well for them. Yeah. And then if they're really curious, the parent can read some of the information on each page to give them more facts that they want, but you can you can sort of adjust depending on the kid, which is great. Yeah. Yes. And actually those kinds of books have been some of my more, most successful books are mm -hmm. the really uh, dual level books. Okay. Like. And then um, other books, uh, more storytelling books uh, like, uh, well, like Waiting for a Warbler. And, and Actually, this one is, is technically fiction, you know, so mm -hmm. it's not, not 
fiction because I'm telling this, this it's not an actual true story or event. Right. And, and so it's really more like faction. I've heard that word used a lot. Mm -hmm. so it's, mm -hmm. kind of, it's kind of non, it's very non-fictiony, but it's technically a fictional story. Yes. And so, um, so that there's there's that kind of thing and then at the other end are books like um let me grab oh a platypus probably and and this book uh does all this one kind of uh is also technically faction as well but it, it just focuses on one individual platypus to explain everything about them so whenever, whenever possible, I do try to tell a story. Um, and often they're kind of technically faction stories, but, mm -hmm. but when I can tell a straight nonfiction story, I'll do that too. Mm -hmm. So do you know where they shelve this book and your platypus book in the library? Do you know if it's in the fiction or the nonfiction section? I'm pretty sure the platypus book is in the nonfiction section. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this one, I don't know yet. I Yeah, this would be, to, I bet this is because the title, the, the kids are kind of the the through story. And right. that's the fiction part. That's yeah. that's the, so this could probably will end up in fiction, but that always, I always find that very interesting when you're straddling the line. I always say, see where they put it in the library. And then you know if it's considered more fiction or nonfiction. I think it really depends on the ultimate purpose of the book. Um, right. And, and then they make that judgment call somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I know our, our friend Steve here had a, a book recently about um, a, kind of a place to call home. And that book also could kind of fall into that category. So maybe on the chat, he could say where, uh, give the, the title of that mm -hmm. and, and um, tell where that book's being shelved as well. Because I think it, it kind of falls into similar categories of platypus. Book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, I did want to talk, um, I, I wanted to show a, a few of your books here because I think they're, they span an interesting uh, range of age and content for the format uh, and format that I wanted people to look at because we consider all of these sort of nonfiction picture books, and yet they're very different from, from fiction picture books. So Catching Air, love <laughs> this book so much. Um, and the Ill the uh, photographs are amazing. So this is another Tilbury House book. So again, you've got, this is basically expository, right? I mean, you've got, uh, it's, it's informational is the purpose of this book but you've got these amazing photographs and the whole point is uh it's gl animals that glide you know that that catch air so that's that's holding that's the theme of the book holding all the info together um so this is going to and you've got i love the way the information is organized you've got um you know sort of the main text here you've got these how nature works, sort of little separate facts pulled mm -hmm. out. You've got uh, annotations to all the photos that that show us what we're looking at. I mean, there's just a lot of levels. And I think kids who are sort of reluctant readers are probably very drawn to this kind of format. Do you find that's true in your experience? Yeah, my experience is that most of my books really appeal to reluctant readers. And mm -hmm. I think it's because they're of the high interest information in them. Uh -huh. and, but it's also like in that case, uh, design wise, that's a really interesting book. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I write a book like that, I always have a main text, but I'm also always searching for sidebars like mm -hmm. the how nature works part at the bottom mm -hmm. of the, the right, right. page there. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in this though, uh, but sometimes the designer, the editor sees something different. And so something I thought was the main text, they'll actually pull out into a sidebar or something huh. like that. And yeah. I think that's very effective. I think uh, you have to have uh, for books these days, it has to be interesting graphically and visually for them. Absolutely. And especially for reluctant readers, having those small pieces of information mm -hmm. helps. And often I, I'd be surprised if a reluctant reader would read that straight through, they'd probably mm -hmm. skip around and look at the things that really interest them and then read that. Probably do. And that is one sort of mark of expository nonfiction. You can skip around if you want, whereas narrative, you can't. You you will lose the thread if you uh, if you just jump into the middle um, right. of a narrative nonfiction. So yes, so, and I can't remember what, um, what age group the publisher put on this, but I think it was like, six to nine six to ten five, five maybe five to nine somewhere in there again it's depends on if it's being read to the kid or they're reading it on their own but um but yeah definitely that first second third grade classroom use for sure so then we have another one again i love this book one iguana two iguanas so this is um also with Tilbury. Now this one is a little bit longer. So that one was, I think, 40 pages, that book. This is the same number of pages, but there's a lot more. We start getting, I think, you, almost like chapters. Not They're not really designated as chapters, but you've got these sections that break up the information because you're telling a much heftier story here, aren't you, with with this book? And actually, that one is more of a story. Than it is it. more narrative. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the fun things about writing that book is there is this compelling story about how the first lizard got to the Galapagos Islands and then how it evolved into these two different species, very different mm -hmm. species. Mm -hmm. And so with that one, I was thinking storytelling the whole time. You know, mm -hmm. not just getting all the information in there, not just looking at this and then looking at that. It's like telling the, this whole story of evolution of these lizards mm -hmm. and, and working in what scientists have learned about them as it's right. going along. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there's yeah. a great little chart there. Yeah, just just really fascinating. And then you, talk, you bring in Charles Darwin at the end, which I thought was like, whoa, uh, really cool connection yep. there um and so I, I thought that was really interesting so when you write a book like this do you outline it first all of these sort of subheads like rise of the land iguanas are those sort of points on an outline for you or how do you organize this information occasionally i will just make a list of the topics i want to include in fact, I was doing that for a magazine article I'm working on here. Um, this is my notebook that I write everything in. Mm. And you can see, I think right here, there, it's got a list of things I want to include in the article. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. about as much as I ever do as far as outlining. Wow. Um, uh, same with fiction. I used to, I've tried outlining fiction. And I just ended up with a story that felt really stiff to me. Mm -hmm. And and just, I, I didn't like how it turned out. And I think mm -hmm. because when you're writing fiction, you have to leave that space for surprising things to happen. And if mm -hmm. you have an outline you're trying to stick to, there's no space for those that character to say something out of the blue that you never expected right or a, an unforeseen event to just happen you know that mm -hmm. you didn't know was coming and so yeah. yeah um so yeah i don't outline a lot usually there may be some very technical things that i'm writing that i will outline but that's rare mm -hmm. so you just do all this research mm -hmm. and then do you just kind of look at it and go okay this should go first and then I'm going to go over here and then you know how do you kind of wrap your arms around it I think there's a lot of uh subconscious work that mm -hmm. goes so I'm feeding this information into my brain and I think my brain is just sorting it into ways that 
would be effective or make sense. And that makes total sense because human evolution has in many ways been a story of stories, right? Right. Telling stories. That's how we've communicated information since day one. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, I think that my brain is just, is just doing a lot of work I'm not even fully aware of down there. And yeah. usually I'll, I'll give it a few days and then at some point I'll think, okay, I'm ready to take a crack at this. Mm-hmm. Great, great. Do you ever um, sort of go down one road and then go, nope, this is not the right way and then have to backtrack and, and start over? with your approach to a topic? Definitely, yeah, yeah. that's happened quite a few times. Yeah, um, I'd say usually I get lucky and hit on an approach I like at first, but uh, like that article I just showed you the little outline of, I'm not at all sure my, I started writing it yesterday and I'm not at all sure that that's what I'm gonna do with it because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not really pleased with it so far. <laughs> and so then I, I'll look at something else. And, um, and every once in a while, another person may suggest another approach that, mm-hmm. that is better. Mm-hmm. And so um, not always, but sometimes that happens. Yeah. So even, you know, you've got decades of experience, but even people with so much experience, it's that flexibility and being able to pivot if necessary to best serve your book, um, which is so important, I think, for any kind of writing, really. Yeah, absolutely. And probably a lot of people have said this, but when I set out to write write something, I always set my goal as writing something that I would want to read. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm writing in a very staid, kind of dull manner, I'm not going to want to read it later, right? So it's, yeah. it's um, so that, that is kind of a good way to compel myself or inspire myself to try mm-hmm. to do better. Right, right. Great. So I just want to look at a couple more of your books here, uh, the nonfiction. So then we go to Woodpeckers, oh, yeah. which um, this is, uh, when you you photographed, you did the photos for this book, right? I did and published it. Uh-huh. And published it. And this one, we have a table of contents. So not really chapters, but this is sort of those subheads that you put in the table of contents so readers can jump right to where they want certain information if they need to, which is great if they're doing a school report on woodpeckers, right. you know, right. very right. smart. Um, but again, gorgeous design, beautiful pictures, lots more text. We're moving up here in text. You can see this has a lot more text even than the iguana book. So I think of this as really middle grade territory for the readers here. Personally, when I see this sort of the eight to 12 or, you know, um, even seven, really good, you know, a really good reader in like second grade might be able to, to read a lot of this, but is that kind of what you had in mind when you were creating this book? You know, I'll be honest with you. I don't really worry a lot about the grade levels and the age level. Mm -hmm. It's going to read it. I write this, the book uh, that I think um, is appropriate to the information that I wanted. Great. And so with, with, that book, I kind of think of it as probably grade three through six or two through five, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the great thing about nonfiction also is that an eighth or ninth grader can pick yes. it up and get just as Absolutely. much enjoyment out of it and mm-hmm. interest out of it. And so I'm always I'm always thinking the widest range possible mm-hmm. about reading the books. So. I think that's very true. And this does not look like a little kid's book. So certainly a middle schooler could pick this up, get tons of great information out of it, use it for whatever purpose they need it for, uh, or even if they're just really interested in this topic Um, and, um, and not feel like they're reading down, you know, they're 
so so that's that's really awesome and then oh, i have to mind if i mention something about that sure. so this mm -hmm. i'll have to tell everyone this is probably my favorite book that i of mine that i published myself and mm -hmm. one thing uh that i like so much about it is that there's a lot of humor in it too mm -hmm. and um one of the funny things i did and this is something that self-publishing allows you to do that you might not get away with is I, um, I I took all the photos for the book, but of mm -hmm. course, you don't always get the photo that you want, right? And a lot of times I was thwarted in getting the woodpecker photo <laughs> that I wanted. So in the back, I put a section called woodpecker photo bloopers. Mm -hmm. and I'd never seen that <laughs> in a nonfiction children's book before. And I think it was one of the things people loved the most about the book too. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, that's great. That's great. And it also shows kids who are aspiring photographers uh, that not every photo is going to turn out, you know, it's so you're going to have bloopers. <laughs> that's right. just part of the process. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And then finally, I want to show this one, which is also an extraordinary book. Um, Hopping ahead of climate change, snowshoe hares, science and survival. Uh, this has won all kinds of awards. Uh, this is also one that you published, correct? And um, this has bona fide chapters in it. So even though it's in this very heavily illustrated format and it's the larger trim size like a picture book, it, this has chapters. And what I love about this book is this has this real emotional core to the topic. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you lay it out right here at the very beginning. And I had, this had never occurred to me until I opened this book. Climate change is affecting animals whose coats turn color with the seasons, who turn color with the seasons, because as with this snowshoe hare, He's white because it's winter, but guess what? There's no snow on the ground. So he is a sitting, he's a target yep. for every predator in the forest. And he is at the bottom of the food chain too. Yeah, unfortunate. <laughs> so, yeah. Poor guy. So he, he doesn't stand a chance. And I was like, of course. But when you lay that out right at the beginning, you give readers this emotional connection with what's going on. And then they're like, well, what are we going to do about this? I have to keep reading. And it's fascinating. And then you do have this scientist that you follow, Scott Mills, mm -hmm. which gives it a nice narrative structure about what he's doing, studying these animals. Um, so I just thought this was just a, a really great, uh, approach and then you expand it out to other animals uh, and talk about how this isn't just the snowshoe hare it's right. affecting a lot around the world and so um i just thought that was that was really fascinating so how how did you get the idea for this and did you come up with all of this well this is one of the real advantages to doing original research for mm -hmm. your topic uh, basically this book is scott's book you okay know, um, he he did all of the pioneering research on this. Mm -hmm. uh, I met him and he shared the story with me and I just thought, wow, that, that is really a powerful story. And, and it also is a good lesson, lesson in patience because when we first talked about this book, mm -hmm. he didn't have the complete story yet, but I, I wanted to sell it. In fact, I got a contract for the book um, from Houghton Mifflin and uh that's when what happened then oh the great recession hit i think and so just things fell apart rapidly right. and um and it's it's was such a good thing that that happened because that allowed another four or five years to pass and mm -hmm. forgot to really fill in the story mm. that i told in the book and really mm -hmm. get the data that that the story needed to share and so, um, and that, that's why like whatever your field is that you're writing about, it, oh, I know, aren't they? Isn't that a great picture? <laughs> oh my cool. gosh. Yeah. <laughs> by, the, by the way, everyone, um, Scott and his students call these hares the cheeseburgers of the forest. So right. that's how many things eat them and how vulnerable they are. <laughs> but um, 
but whatever your, your field is, it just behooves you so much to meet as many experts as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think this is true of Steve also. Um, mm -hmm. you know, some of our best books have just come from these scientists that we meet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how much time do you spend? Uh, you said oh, this took over several years because the contract was canceled, but then you got to stay in contact with Scott. Yes. But yes. when doing your initial research, do you spend like weeks and weeks just sort of shadowing uh, someone like this as they go about their work? Or how, how do you conduct your research? It really depends on the, on the book a lot. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, a book like um, Hopping Ahead of Climate Change, I probably went out to the field with Scott maybe three times. He, he set out traps for the hares and we'd go check them and, and get them and tag them and that sort of thing. Um, I also, he, halfway through this project, he moved to North Carolina to take a different position. And he had a lot of lab work going there that I wanted to include in the book. So I flew back to North Carolina and spent about a week with him back there as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was a lot of uh, reading original scientific papers and things like that. So I'd say as far as my effort, the time I put in this book probably took a solid four or five months of my working time to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Whereas a picture book, um, like, you know, a platypus probably or something like that, um, that may be more on the order of six weeks or something like that. You right. Know, still right. reading scientific papers and things, mm -hmm. but um, most of the time is really spent on the writing. Yeah. Great. I know you, you wanted to share some pages from your book that's not out yet. Oh, uh, yeah. You yeah. want to share your screen and we can take a look at those. I would love to see them. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. Um, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been doing books like Woodpeckers and um, Catching Air and things like that, more illustrated with photos of a little older audience. And then um, three out of the f last four books I sold were illustrated picture books again. And so uh, waiting for a warbler is the first of those, but uh, in the fall, I have one that I'm really excited about as well, and I will share that, and that's called uh, Beaver and Otter Get Along, Sort of, <laughs> and uh, the subtitle, A Story of Grit and Patience Between Neighbors, and that was added by the editor, not me, but I like it, so... Uh, <laughs> And one thing I'll say off offhand, this was Meg Sedano's first picture book, and I was just bowled away by what she did. Wow. With it. And um, like Waiting for a Warbler, this book is driven by characters. And, and I just love this first, this first couple of pages. It's, when Beaver wandered into the valley, he heard the most exciting sound in the entire world, running water. The sound made Beaver's whole body quiver. It told him, this is the place. A stream trickled through the valley. Aspen, alder, and pine trees lined its banks. Beaver got right to work. An hour later, crash. And so uh, the book just goes uh, then, uh, just goes like that. And I just want to point out how even though this, this is uh, about real animals, look at the character that our artist puts into these illustrations. Absolutely. I just love what she did with Beaver here. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, so Beaver, you know, he gets his house all set up. He builds dams and uh, everything's going well. And then guess who shows up? Otter. <laughs> and so um, this book illustrates something called a commensal relationship, a relationship in which one species benefits from another, but the other mm -hmm. species isn't benefiting at all from yeah. that first one. And so otters take full advantage of beavers, but as far as anyone knows, um, beavers do not benefit by otters uh, at all. Uh, and yet, so, but otters often move into beavers' ponds and things like that. So this, this was just really a fun story to write. And 
uh, I was just bowled over by the illustrations too. And so I can't wait for it to come out. Mm -hmm. And at now, the end, uh, they've added uh, a, a lot of um, informational mm -hmm. uh, stuff at the end here too. We've got that too. So that yeah. was great. So you did not put words in the animals' mouths. In other words, they they are they're not anthropomorphized. No. You no. Stop short of that, which I think is really important. Uh, it keeps the book more realistic, obviously. Um, I'm curious as to whether they will consider that fiction or nonfiction. Probably fiction, I would imagine. I think it's going to end up fiction, too. But I'm not, uh, yeah, again, it's, it's a book that could go either way. Yeah. But that looks like a really fun story. So when does that come out? That comes out, I think, in August or September. I'm not quite sure the release Great. date. Of that. Great. That's that's one to look forward to for sure. I'm glad we got to see it. So I I do want to get to some questions here. I know you've all asked. And are you? Do you have a? Uh, do you have to leave at the top of the hour? Or can you give us a little extra no, time? I'm good. Great. Yep. Normally I try to get us out of here in an hour, but we've had such a good chat, and I see there's several questions for you. I did want to touch briefly on your fiction because you do write uh, middle grade and YA mystery and thrillers and uh, a lot of it has dogs, I noticed. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, I'm a dog lover. And oh, the dog. Me too. I totally get that. And, um, and, and also these, tell us a little bit about um, your fiction. It's pub you publish this yourself and so the bucking horse press or bucking horse books rather and that has a focus of sort of regional western themes so right. how does your fiction fit in with that yeah so uh you know most of my nonfiction books that i've done with bucking horse books in fact um the name of the the press came from my very first book that i did is called the world famous miles city bucking horse sale and so, um, and that was a book I just really believed in and, and just wanted to, it needed to be in the world. And so I, I couldn't sell it to a publisher. So I just did it myself. Mm -hmm. But I, at that time I was writing a lot of fiction. Um, I'd had a few novels published by Peachtree, um, but I also wanted to tell local stories and especially mm -hmm. I was in kind of a mystery uh, phase like that, excuse me. And so at that time, we had a very famous governor who had a very famous dog. And, and I was just thinking about that. Here's a, a picture of my son in the governor's chair uh, with <laughs> Brian Schweitzer and me in the background. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, it just, I was just asking myself a question. Oh, wow. What if that dog went missing? you know, mm -hmm. what would happen. And so it, that just kicked off all these ideas about characters and also where to locate it. So that that first mystery, the governor's dog is missing, missing is located in Helena, Montana. And um, mysteries are interesting because you have to kind of reverse engineer them. Mm -hmm. And so you, you know what happens at the beginning, you know what happens at the end but mysteries are very challenging because you have to work out all the stages in between. And mm -hmm. so my son and I, we just took two trips over to Helena and we just explored. We just looked at stuff and, you know, I'd see like uh, there's a famous candy shop over there. And I thought, hmm, how could this work into the story? We went back some old staircases, you know, like, oh, where does this lead? Uh, there was an old fire tower we climbed up. And so uh, I, I was just, and taking hundreds of photos too. Photographs are very useful for doing research like this. Mm -hmm. And so I came back and I just kind of started putting the pieces in order uh, for how these kids would solve the mystery. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like mystery is one exception to your I don't outline rule <laughs> or tendency. Where, because you do have to have a series of events in the right order that makes sense for the mystery and and gets you to where you need to go. Um, so, are those the kinds of things you kind of planned out ahead before writing? 
the first draft. Yeah, I really, I did have to do that with those. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, I don't know what else I can add to that, except the mysteries yeah. definitely require more, more structure that you sure. have to be aware of. Sure. So. Yeah. Do you have in, in your mysteries, is it important that the protagonist be able to solve the mystery, that it be something age appropriate that the protagonist can actually solve without a bunch of adults helping out? Oh, no, I think it's essential. The protagonist has to solve the mystery. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they can get clues from adults, but they can't, they can't, um, right. let the adults solve it for them. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's really important. Okay, good. Yeah, I do too. I totally agree. <laughs> so before I take some questions, I wanted to ask you um, about your, your press, uh, oh. Bucking Horse Books. You had lots of success getting published by other people. What possessed you to start your own publishing house? What was the inspiration there? It was actually a combination of things. I'd, I'd always thought about doing it, um, considered doing it, especially at that time I was doing a lot of school visits. Um, and so, you know, you go to a school and you sell a hundred books and you might make, I don't know, 30 or $40 in royalties from a hundred books. And I thought, gosh, you know, if I controlled these books myself, I might make $500 in royalties uh, mm -hmm. from, from the books. So I'd always thought about doing it. Um, but then when the, the great recession hit, um, it was a lot like what happened when COVID hit. Publishers just stopped buying books. And, um, you know, I just was dead in the water, except that I was still writing like crazy, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I just had the idea, I thought, you know, I wonder if I could uh, write and publish these regional books and be successful doing it. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the last 10 years, I published about 10 books, I think exactly 10 books. And, um, and some have been successful and some haven't, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, the governor's dog was missing and and dog 4491 have done pretty well the mm -hmm. sequel to the governor's dog was missing hangman's gold did not you know mm -hmm. and so um in fact my most successful books have probably been the the three science books i've done uh woodpeckers um hopping ahead of climate change and another one called firebirds here mm -hmm. and um and so, but all during that time, I, I never intended to only publish my own books. I, again, I'm very uh, prolific. And so I've kept sending books out to other publishers the entire time. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, I'm not sure that I'll ever publish another book myself. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, I think the sales numbers have continued to deteriorate over the last 10 years. Um, School visits are not nearly as robust, so you're not selling books through that avenue, at least for me, that's been the case. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so yeah, the numbers, are, if anything, have grown dicier in the last 10 years for self-publishing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you kind of asked this um, in one of your emails, you know, I, th I think I would say don't self-publish. I would tell most people don't do it. Um, because you're gonna end up with a thousand books that you can't move. That's just the reality. I'd say mm -hmm. there are a couple of exceptions to that. One, if you're an active speaker and you can sell your books where you're speaking. So you've got a built-in audience, a book tailored to that audience. I don't care if it's a school or not, but if you're on a speaking circuit, I would say self-publishing can work for you. Mm -hmm. and the other instance where I think self-publishing can work is if you have a really niche market like outlet. Let's say you're really into knitting and you're connected to a hundred knitting stores and you know they need a good children's book on knitting. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go, right? If you can get your book into those hundred stores, mm -hmm. you're probably gonna do all right with it. Mm -hmm. So I'd say those are the two instances. Otherwise, I'd say, you know, I hate to say it, don't do it. 
Yeah. Well, and it, the way you do it too, you, you do it so well with the, the photographs, even if you take your own photos, just printing books in full color with all these photos is expensive. Um, right much more expensive than printing a novel with no illustrations. So um, I can see where your margins have to be good to, to justify laying out all that kind of money, uh, that money up front. Right. And if you do do it, I think a key piece that a lot of people don't think about is distribution. Mm -hmm. So I only started this because I was able to connect with a local publisher who agreed to distribute my books. And you don't want to have to deal with that, the ordering and all that yourself. No. And so, um, so if you are going to do it, try to find some umbrella publisher to do it under so they can handle the actual book sales. They're going right. to take a chunk of it, but it is really worth it, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Because otherwise you'd have to hire an employee to handle that for you. I mean, you know, it's, it's a big job distribution and order fulfillment and all of that. Yeah. He is. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Well, let's get to some questions here. Um, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, so Deanne, first of all, says I am a FWS bird biologist. I'm sure you know what that means. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. And excited to see waiting for a warbler. Uh, I have been a longtime fan and I wish to emulate Sneed's work. How do I write nonfiction when I'm the expert? Um, oh, yeah. Good yeah. question. I think you're perfectly positioned to do that. And um, I would say, um, I would say probably, unless you're doing a lot of your own research, maybe a straight exposition approach would be really good. Um, mm -hmm. By the way, another way I just I was going to mention that self publishing might work. Uh, for instance, here in town, we have a place called the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and they have a bookstore, right. And so uh, if I were an elk expert, um, I would think, hmm, maybe I could write a book and self publish it and sell it to that store. Mm -hmm. And that actually has kind of worked for that store uh, with another writer. Um, but you being the expert, I, so I would say, uh, unless you're doing your own original research, uh, just exposition, straight exposition would work well. Or you could do, tell a story like you saw in Waiting for a Warbler, um, because you know so much about a particular species or ecosystem. Or if you're doing your own research, I wouldn't be shy about talking about that mm -hmm. so, and just write it in the first person. It I was going to say, does just, just first person work in certain situations? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. You still have to find that sort of compelling arc to the narrative, even in first person, something that's going to be real, your readers are going to be able to relate to. Um, like with the climate change, you know, the hare is a, is, is a target <laughs> for yeah. every, yeah. every other animal. Um, and I think uh, that is a challenge in first person, not to make it sound like you're just talking about yourself, but you're really talking to the reader. You're finding that uh, angle that's going to appeal to the reader and be relevant to them. Definitely, definitely. And you brought up a great point too. You need that arc. And so the arc could be, well, maybe it's an endangered species. Maybe there's all kinds of superlative behaviors it exhibits mm -hmm. that other species don't. Um, yeah, or, or maybe it's a keystone species, something like that, that a lot of other species depend on, something like that. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, by the way, Beth Stillborn just told me in the Q&A that she searched three libraries for waiting for a warbler and it's cataloged as juvenile fiction. So that answers our question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now I know. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so a different Beth asks, uh, when submitting nonfiction text, mm -hmm. how do you refer to sort of the small text or the non read aloud portion like you had in your example there in your right. submission? So do you call it a sidebar? 
Do you set it off somehow on the manuscript page? How do you indicate to the publisher which information is which? What I do, um, like with a book like A Platypus probably, is I, I paginate the manuscript. Uh, editors say they don't like that, but I've found that editors often can't really see what you're shooting for unless you do it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so um, I will put the big text uh, in regular size font up at the top of the page, and then a couple of line breaks, I'll put the small text in italics. Mm. Below it. And okay. so, um, yeah, that just, that just tells the editor what you're doing there. And, and I do mention it in the, the cover letter, what I've done with the text as well. So they have a heads up. Okay, great, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Susan asks, this is interesting, can you share tips about writing regional historical fiction and nonfiction, so historical, um, picture books and chapter books? Uh, sh she says, should I send queries of this type to regional publishers first? Um, so what is your opinion on that? If you're writing something that has a real regional focus in the, in the storyline, is it should you focus on regional publishers with it? It depends on just how interesting the book is, you know, uh, to a general audience. Like, um, can I enjoy this book only if I live in Montana? Or would I also enjoy it in South Carolina, for instance? Um, for instance, let me grab another book here. So this is a book I wrote a few years ago called Shep, Our Most Loyal Dog. And it's very much a Montana story, but it's a dog story, right? <laughs> everybody loves dogs, right? And I think everybody relates to what this dog went through. And so um, it actually was published by semi-regional publishers, Sleeping Bear Press, um, but it, it has national appeal. Now, but a book like um, the world famous Miles City Bucking Horse Sale, that's really only going to appeal to people who have heard of it or who right. live in adjoining states or something like mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. that kind of book, I would start with regional publishers. Yeah. Okay. Good yeah. point. Uh, briefly, as far as historical fiction or nonfiction, um, any sort of tips off the top of your head that you can convey? <laughs> oh, um, yeah, about, about writing it? About writing it, yeah. Okay, so I would say um, the original research, I think, is so important. I think mm -hmm. what's make, gonna make your story, you know, if I'm writing about Teddy Roosevelt, I gotta get something that nobody else has right mm -hmm. and that nobody else can find by just looking doing a web search okay so one reason Shep our most loyal dog worked is i manage this is a story that takes place in world war ii by the way mm -hmm. in, in the great depression i managed to find somebody still alive who knew Shep very oh. well wow. and, and interviewed him and i'm so glad i did because he died just a couple years after i interviewed him and that story, his story would have been totally lost. And yet it was essential to this legend of Shep. Uh, but nobody had ever interviewed him before about this dog. Um, and so, so with a, a historical fiction like that, if your subject isn't still alive, look for their descendants, you know. Mm -hmm. um, go visit the places that you want to write about. And that will just give you the details for how to bring this alive, mm -hmm. whether it's nonfiction or fiction. Right. Excellent. Um, we've had several questions about photographs. Yeah. And, um, you know, I know that you took the photographs in your Woodpecker's book, but in your other book, um, we've got sort of books that you publish that have a lot of photos and then books published by Tilbury, you know, other publishers that used a lot of photos. Were you responsible, let's talk about the other publishers, <laughs> for, <laughs> for finding the photos or did they handle that for you? You know, that's all negotiable, really. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, like with the one iguana, two iguanas book, I had some of the photos, mm -hmm. uh, but I knew that I, there needed to be a lot more, but I also didn't want to track him down myself. So mm -hmm. he was willing to do that. Of course, you don't get as big a royalty when you do that, right? Right. And so you have to decide, do I want to track these all down myself or do I want to give up, um, give up half my royalty and let them do it? Now, mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, a lot of topics, you can get free government photos because anything that's in any government archive is mm -hmm. free for you to use. So if you're writing a story like the fish and wildlife uh, guy who asked me a question or, or a gal, I didn't see which, um, Fish and Wildlife Service has gobs of photos, right? And so if you can't take them yourself, you've got a really good library at your disposal. In that case, you may wanna take on that part of the contract that mm -hmm. says you're responsible for the photo. Right. But you don't have to do any of that photo research until you have the book contract. You don't have to worry about submitting that with your manuscript to the No, book. but often it will help you sell the book if you've got engaging store uh, photos. So if you personally have photos or have access to them, yes. But as far as going through stock photos or or anything like that, that's done afterward. And remember, you probably will have to pay a fee to use a lot of those photos um, in the book. Yep. Yeah. I will say one thing. If your subject is one where it's hard to get photos, like if I'm writing about snow leopards, uh, which there are probably more photos of them now than there were 20 years ago, but back then there were very few, um, you want to make sure those photos are available and can be purchased and mm. not from National Geographic because they will bankrupt your publisher with the prices they charge, oh, yeah. right? Probably. <laughs> so you need to make sure that you can get them at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, one of the jobs I had way back when I was worked for a publisher was doing photo research for uh, nonfiction books. And it was really, this was before the internet. <laughs> so. Yeah. I physically went to like the Associated Press offices in New York City and went through files of old <laughs> news stories and it was cool. I would get lost for days in those file cabinets, but yeah, it's a, it's a big job. Um, so we had a question about back matter. So when you're writing a picture book like Waiting for a Warbler, um, how do you kind of decide how much back matters going to be in and I know more and more picture books we're seeing even if they're fiction if they've got a lot of in, informational content we're seeing back matter in these picture books I think because they're being used a lot in classrooms um so was this did your did your publisher kind of give you some direction here or was this did you just come up with the topics in the back matter there's standard back matter that you always want to include, like further research, right? You know, different sources for the student or the reader to find out more. Right. Um, also, if I'm telling a story like Waiting for a Warbler, I, I feel like I, I should in the back matter give a broader context for what's mm -hmm. going on with these warblers and why it's important to have native plants in your yard, excuse mm -hmm. me, uh, to support um, but sometimes, uh, like the, the Beaver and Otter book I showed you, that company uh, is not just publishing a nice picture book, they are publishing it specifically to go into classrooms. And so they're doing a little research themselves with teachers like, okay, what do you need to see in here to make this useful in your classroom, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't tend to go overboard with that. Uh, myself. Uh, but um, like waiting for a warbler, I think, or uh, one iguana, two iguanas, the, um, the publisher said, uh, <laughs> I, one reason I love working with Tilbury is they don't mind making the book a little longer. And so uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they err on the side of a luxurious feel rather than cramping it or crunching everything together. 
-hmm. And so I think with one or those two of those books, he, he said, hey, I've got a couple extra pages in the book. Do you want to put something in there? And I thought, oh, yeah, I could add something for that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's so nice. It evolves in different ways. It is nice having all that space and the publisher letting you stretch out, <laughs> you know, and not not have to worry about 32 pages. That that is very nice. Yeah. 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 All right. Last question. Then we're going to let you go here. Um, do you when you're interviewing people or studying them as, as a subject of your book, do they have to sign any kind of release or do you have them sign a release allowing you to write about them? Uh, and also, do you show them your manuscript before it's published or do you just send them the book? <laughs> um, the only time I've ever asked anyone to sign releases are when I want to have photos of children in the book mm. and I have their parents and the children sign releases or mm. if I want to use their work in a, a book or like I wrote mm. a, a, a professional development book not too long ago. And I wanted to use some of the kids work that I'd worked with. And so mm -hmm. um, as far as the other question though, I, especially when I'm writing uh, anything that has some technical levels to it, I always have the, the scientists read the book ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I'm just doing a straight expository book, uh, like woodpeckers, um, I will also find a woodpecker expert to read this book and mm -hmm. make sure it's okay. Um, in this book, in fact, I, I quote four or five different scientists and I showed those, those parts of the book to them to make sure. And that's very important because um, if you interview somebody, often the words that they actually speak are not usable. So, oh, yeah. Uh, just grammatically and, and structurally. Mm -hmm. And so I always ask them, uh, do you mind if I tweak this a little bit to make it more readable? And they're usually totally fine with that. But mm -hmm. I want them to read it before I send it in. And so right. that's another reason to have them read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, Sneed. Thank you for giving us some extra time tonight. Uh, really appreciate it. It was such a great discussion and I wanted to be able to at least get to some of the questions that people have asked. So we really appreciate your time, your expertise, all the information you shared and all of your books. We appreciate those very, very much. So well, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Mm -hmm. It's great being on here with you guys. And I hope I, I got to most of your questions anyway. You did. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, take care, everybody. Yes. So, nice, nice to see you. Thank you all. And we will see you next week. Bye.